on today's show. Today, Randall and Chanel have a ministry called Redeemed Life, and they lead men and women's Bible studies. They enjoy visits with their adult son, Bryce, and the couple finds joy in raising their two young nephews. Their love for each other is stronger than ever, and it's all because they learn to love each other as Christ loves them. It took God to restore this marriage. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Glad you joined us today. Brian, we're going to talk about amazing things that God does in relationships today. And I know that as a pastor, you've experienced seeing God redeem a lot of relationships, haven't you? Oh, my goodness, Lori. You know, it seems like that is one of the number one areas uh, uh, that I am able to not only engage, but see the beauty of how God is able to turn relationships in a direction that they become fruitful and prosperous. You know, when you start thinking about relationships, yeah, the tricky so thing is, is when you start dealing with the emotional part of that, because it, it can go a lot of different ways. And we're going to see that today too, Lori. Yes, we are. We're going to see marriages that, you know, survive, not only survive, but thrived after infidelity and, and it takes, you know, measures of forgiveness. It takes uh, a supernatural healing. But we've got to be willing to go on a healing journey, don't we, Brian? You've got it, you know. And you've got to remember, the healing is in the journey. It's not in the destination, but it's each step that you take along the way, Lori. And I, I find so many times when we go through a moment of trauma, we want it to be ended right away, but it didn't come. It's it's not so much as a blowout as it is a slow leak. So that journey allows us to continue to do what needs to be done in order to live strong and just fruitful lives. Well, you know what's something that's hap helped me a lot, Brian, is recognizing relationships. Hey, there's an assumption there's more than just you. <laughs> There's other people involved. <laughs> and you you can't take responsibility for everyone else, but you sure can take responsibility for yourself. You know, when you're pointing the finger this way, there's how many fingers pointing back at you? And you got to own your own stuff and be willing to let God heal you. And that is, I'd say, 90% of the journey. I agree. That's exactly what Brett and Brittany found out, Whitney, excuse me, found out in their journey. And this is how God turned it around. I learned to compartmentalize things. I learned to hide over 20 years of using pornography. I learned how to hide from my wife. When Whitney and Barrett Wilson got married, his secret life with porn brought an unknown darkness to their marriage. As the years went by, like I was, con you know, continue to be further in darkness and isolation, and she was growing in her faith, and that divide between us just continue to grow and grow. And I think I thought it was all me and I was wrong and put a lot of weight on just performing and getting better on my own. And that darkness just kept growing at that time. As he continued to hide his porn addiction, Barrett eventually had an affair with a coworker. And they were friends of ours outside of work. And so it all seemed safe you know like our, our world seemed safe it seemed like it was okay and obviously those boundaries were crossed and it led to led to the affair barrett couldn't stand the guilt and ended the affair after a couple of months but the shame still consumed him i just remember telling god like if it's true that that i'm supposed to tell this to my wife and not just live with it until i die then you're gonna have to somehow tell her or make make it come out because i can't I was sitting there and I remember the phrase going across my mind, Barrett's had an affair with that person. One night, Whitney looked through old messages on Barrett's computer and found evidence of the affair. I mean, there was a flood of emotions in that moment. Um, I think I was more angry than I'd ever been. I've learned since that that's because something I love so much was, had been hurt and damaged. Probably at that point, I thought beyond repair. Whitney immediately left, and I mean, I just believed 
that that was the end of our marriage. Hurt and broken, they both turned to their pastor and his wife for help. I just told him, look, I had an affair. Whitney knows about it, and I don't know what to do. And he just hugged me, you know? And I, again, it's not what I expected, but he, he hugged me and told me he loved me. And, and I just shared everything with him. Every corner of darkness in my heart that I could think of. These women carried me to Jesus, and they were comforting. They also challenged me to look to Christ and say, what did Christ do for us? In the midst of the pain and betrayal, they decided to pursue reconciliation. Whitney told me that, you know, she had always loved me. And even then, knowing what I had done, she still loved me. I just remember thinking, like, I have to do whatever I can to stay married to this woman, like I have to. One night as they spent time together, God changed Barrett's heart. Whitney was kind of at a place where she just couldn't be consoled, just you know, in her hurt and in her pain. And I mean, I just didn't know what to do. I couldn't fix anything. And I just felt this tug in my heart to go and get my Bible and just start reading the book of Romans. I was reading to her that night. It was like I had never heard any of this before. And whenever I got to Romans 5 and, you know, read that while we were still rebels and enemies of God, that God wanted to prove his love for us and that he sent Christ to die for our sins, and I just was losing it. He started reading, and it was seriously this weird flip where all of a sudden he starts crying. And I think I honestly, in a kind of funny way, was like, what's happening? And kind of shocked by his tears almost. I had never seen him moved by anything he read in the Bible. And so somehow the spirit kind of calmed me down in that moment and hearing him read and seeing him being so broken over the words he was reading and identifying so much with his own sin and seeing him his own story on those pages. You know, I had a father in heaven that truly loved me unconditionally despite everything that I had done, every, every destructive thing I had done, all the darkness that I had lived in, even knowing that while I still lived in that, that God wanted to prove his love for me and that he sent Jesus to die for me to pay the price that I should have to pay and to die the death that I really deserve. That was truly the turning point where God really started to um, put our lives back together and put, or not put them back together, give me a new life and give us a new marriage. God was slowly showing me that I could be forgiving and loving towards Barrett while still hating the thing that had happened and being very angry at that piece of it while still offering grace and forgiveness to Barrett. The Holy Spirit was just amidst so many things he was, you know, the Holy Spirit was doing was even showing me like my behavioral patterns of, okay, this is going to lead to pornography. Don't do this, don't do that. And just being obedient to that. And so I haven't looked at pornography in, you know, almost nearly three years now. Barrett is free from his pornography addiction. The couple now shares a mutual love for Jesus and is looking forward to starting a family through adoption hopes for my marriage now is to continue walking in light with Whitney and to serve her and to love her and to bathe her in scripture so that God gets the glory and that she feels his love through me. I think my hope for our marriage is that we continue to walk in that path and even as we adopt and bring kids into our marriage that that belief I had where the husband and wife do become one is still true today and even more true today than ever it's ever been. I'm grateful that I'm living a life that I don't deserve because of the work that Christ did on my behalf. Wow, after years, the secret comes out, and it's really only by a miraculous grace of God that their marriage was rescued and saved. But more importantly, Barrett came to know Jesus. And isn't this just the truth that sometimes it's through a terrible loss that we discover what we actually really need in our life, and that's Jesus. Barrett said, I'm grateful that living a life that I that I'm living a life that I don't deserve because of the work that Christ did on my behalf. You know, when I heard him say that, I'm like, that's the gospel. See, the gospel is that we're all living a life 
that we don't deserve. And the only reason that we can have life and have it to the full, as Jesus promised us in John 10, 10, that when we put our trust in the work of Jesus, what he did on the cross in coming and dying for our sin and rising again and coming back to life to overcome, you know, death, the Satan and sin itself, then that is why we get to live a life that we don't deserve. That's why actually we get a new day, this resource we talk about all the time. It's a great resource because it outlines why you can have a life that you don't deserve. All the scripture references and, and resources that with questions um, to answer your questions are found in this little resource. And maybe, you know, you've trusted Jesus, but you don't recognize what you've got. Well, see, the gospel is that you don't deserve anything but punishment and separation from God. But because of Jesus, we're given life. Maybe today you're like, I need that. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I recognize my need of you. I'm a sinner and I'm so far from you. Forgive me for trying to live life on my own. I recognize that you came and died for me because you love me. I receive your love and your forgiveness. Come into my life and make me brand new in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you, call us 1-855-759-0700. We'll give you this resource. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you because now you're living a life that you never deserved and it's the best life. In 1998, Randall and Janelle Stewart met and married in Kentucky. Janelle was 17 years old and pregnant with their son. Randall was 18 and joined the Air Force to provide for his new family. Stationed in North Dakota, the couple was hopeful for a fresh start. I just felt like, wow, this is my chance. I'm grown up now. I can start a new life. But things quickly uh, went the other direction. I think the reality was that we married too young, so we wanted to be free and do what we wanted to do. And with their freedom, there was also temptation. We began to go out. We could hang out at clubs. Uh, many friends that we met on base party. Uh, a lot of the friends that we were around were having affairs. We began to have communication issues. When um, issues would arise that we would need to talk about, I would want to talk about them, and Randall would want to um, isolate himself. He didn't really want to talk about it. And so that made me matter and mattered. So in order to get a response from him, I committed adultery. So I'm like, okay, she did this to me, so I, I gotta get her back. And so that's when I start going out and, you know, having affairs. They say their communication problems stemmed from dysfunction in their individual pasts. I believe that both of us came in with woundedness. Both of us had father wounds and being rejected. And so we brought this baggage into our marriage. When Chanel wanted to discuss a matter, you know, if it angered me, I just wanted to be left alone. Their behavior toward each other grew more destructive and violent with daily arguments and at times physical abuse. In 1993, they divorced. But over the next 10 years, Randall and Chanel would engage in a toxic on and off relationship, sometimes living with each other while still divorced. If he said the sky was blue, I was gonna say it was red. It was just constant turmoil and conflict. And so while we were very intimate with each other, we couldn't get along with each other. In 2004, the couple was living together in Kentucky. Randall had a reliable job, and Chanel was a newly licensed cosmetologist, discouraged about her lack of clients and struggling to earn income. Although at the salon, she quickly found a friend in another hairstylist. 
Her name was Pat, and I admired her. I knew there was something different about her, but I just didn't know what. So as I began to talk to Pat at the salon and I found out that she was a Christian, one day I actually asked her uh, if I could go to church with her. And she was like, yeah. She began attending church regularly. And during a service on October 31st, 2004, Chanel says her heart changed for good. I just knew that I was at the bottom rock bottom and that something needed to change in order for me and my life to get better. I ended up at the altar and it, it literally was like a vision that I could see of Jesus and I could see his arms stretched wide and say, I've been waiting on you, my daughter. So once I gave my life to God, I knew that it was, it was a sin for me and Randall to live together. Um, and not be married. I prayed about my situation more. Lord, if this is not where you have for me, you know I don't have anywhere to go. So what do I do from here? Meanwhile, Randall began to examine his feelings for Chanel. The, the biggest thing that made me not want to lose her is that she has always like put like my best interest before her. So she always made sure, would always try to make sure I was okay, and so just having somebody to care for you like that, it just meant the world. And so for me to be able to keep her, you know, I was gonna have to marry her. So I just came home one day and asked her, baby, you, just, you wanna do this or what? She said yes, and in 2005, the couple remarried. Chanel continued to pray and take their son to church. As Randall began to see positive changes in their lives, he wanted to be a better father and husband he began to attend church too. I'm trying to raise a son and you know, he's growing up in the word and his daddy's out ripping and running the streets. So, you know, I'm trying to raise, you know, a good young man, but I got to be able to show him what that even looks like. During a revival, Randall surrendered to God. I feel like a peace came over me like, okay, I'm taking the right step to, you know, to lead my family. The Stewarts attended Christian counseling and began to pray and study the Bible together respect one another. We have learned how to communicate better with one another, and we have learned how to compromise. She's, she's my, my bestie, that's my BFF. I like sports, my wife hates sports. But, you know, if I would say I'm gonna go to a Bengals game or something like that, she wants to be right there, and vice versa. You know, she talked me into going to a ballet, but I went and I actually enjoyed it. So, you know, we just, we have fun together. Today, Randall and Chanel have a ministry called Redeemed Life, and they lead men and women's Bible studies. They enjoy visits with their adult son, Bryce, and the couple finds joy in raising their two young nephews. Their love for each other is stronger than ever, and it's all because they learn to love each other as Christ loves them. It took God to restore this marriage. He showed us how to be committed and loyal, how to love. God gave us love and he showed us how to love one another. Go Jesus. You know, when you look at Randall and Chanel, you also see that it didn't happen overnight, but it was God's saving grace that saved both of them. You know, when I listened to uh, uh, Chanel, she was saying that I just hit the bottom and I knew she said specifically I was ready for change are you ready for change and uh Rando he says I didn't want to be ripping and roaring out in the street and then trying to tell my son uh that he needed to be a a decent man a good man I wonder if this is also striking a chord with you one question for you are you willing to do it God's way if you're willing to do it God's way, I want to pray with you and I want to get something into your hands. It doesn't cost you anything, but the starting point, because you have to begin to finish, and that is giving your heart to Jesus. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but I want you to call the number on the screen and I want you to request free indeed. And today, start your journey because there is a, a beautiful road on the other side of this prayer. Pray this, Jesus, I surrender. Please help me, Lord. I give you my personal permission for your heavenly intervention. Make me the person you want me to be in Jesus' name. It's as simple as that. Please call now, 1-855-759-0700. 1-855-759-0700.
We'll be right back. We love to hear from our viewers, like Betty from Ontario, who said, thank you for allowing God to work through you and your broadcast. My faith always gets stirred up with the information and stories you share. Wow, we love to hear that, don't we, Brian? What about you? Has this program grown your faith? Do you find encouragement and hope when you watch? If so, consider being a partner with us. We can't do this without the generous donations of people just like you. All gifts are issued a charitable tax receipt, but greater than that, your gift will make a difference in bringing someone to Christ or growing someone's faith. We need your best gift, whether it's $20 a month or $250 a month or a generous one-time gift. So call today or give online and join us. Together, we're committed to sharing the good news of Jesus. Drew. What? Again? You want to have this argument again? Why do you keep bringing this up? I, haven't we been through this a thousand times? Why do you keep bringing this up? Is that you? Do you do you know what that's like? Well, this video is gonna help you to put an end to an argument once and for all, to stop it from coming up again and again and again and again and again. Hey everybody, Coach Drew, so glad you are here to join me in making your relationships the best that they can be. We're gonna talk about how to stop revolving arguments for coming up over and over and over and over again. So first of all, before we get into what you can do about it, let's really understand why this happens. Now, this is not true for everybody because some people just like to bring up old stuff. But for the most part, people bring stuff up when it's unresolved. When it's unresolved, when there's still stuff down there, it's going to keep coming up. And I know people ha have a rule to say, you know, don't bring up stuff from the past. That doesn't work. You know that that just doesn't work. If something hasn't been resolved, it's going to come up. And that's a good thing. If it keeps coming up, it's an indication that there's more there. So let's get into it. What can you do? You can figure out what the unresolved issue is. What that hurt is. Most of the times, people feel unheard. When you can label what that is, when you can ask, what is it? Why does this keep coming up again? Why? Help me understand why, that phrase, help me understand why it keeps coming up again, right? Generally speaking, I tell people not to use the word why because it puts people on the defensive. But if you start with, can you help me understand why that keeps coming up again? And you hear my tone? Very different. And why you keep bringing that up again? Very different. If you don't want to use why, you can say, can you help me understand what is the most important thing about this issue for you? If you can get rid of the why, get rid of it. But if you can't, just put, could you help me understand, right? In a caring way. Number two, understand that they want you to understand how they feel, but they want you to understand what it is that you will do. They need you to do something. If you don't understand what it is that they need you to do, when you don't do that thing again in the future, the same argument is going to come up again. I was working with a couple recently, and it was I, I've seen this many, many times again. When we don't understand the hurt, we don't understand that they're anticipating, they're hypersensitive that this thing is going to happen again. But when you zone in on what it is that they want you to change, what it is that they want you to do differently, that argument's going to stop coming up if you choose to do it. Now, some people, not you, but some people, they get into a relationship and think that they're perfect. I am the way that I am. I'm not going to change. Like, if you refuse to change, if you refuse to grow, if you refuse to sacrifice, if you refuse to, to evolve, what do you think is going to happen to that relationship? People are different. I say it again and again. And it's a fact, but it's a fact that's often not appreciated. In order for two different people to live together, they both got to change. It just might be your turn. So be willing to change. And that's what will stop that argument from coming up again. One, 
hear them out, understand where they're coming from, and two, discover what it is that they want you to do, and three, be willing to change. Well, Brian, we've seen amazing stories of how God can redeem anything in our relationships. It's been really inspiring today. It has been really inspiring. And, and Lori, I believe that it also is timely. Someone was touched during that time. And I feel like what we need to do is we need to pray. And I want to thank you for sending in your prayer request because we appreciate it when you take that time. And Lori, we've got... Uh, We've got Sue, and she's requesting prayer for complete healing from anxiety and depression. What do you have? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a request from Anna. She says, please pray for my son, Justin. He's 35 years old, and he has addiction to painkillers and other substances. Well, I'd be happy to pray for that boy, Justin, because I had my boy, Justin. God healed his addiction. Hey, why don't you lead us? Let's pray. All right, Father, I bring Justin to you in Jesus' name. I say, go get him. Release him and free him in Jesus' name from the power of addiction. Amen. And we just speak against the enemy and we say, be gone in Jesus' name that this boy would rise up and be a man of God who loves and serves you. And would you give Anna strength and hope to continue to trust you while she waits to see you perform your miraculous deed in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, for Sue, we agree, and we break that power of darkness, and we believe for total healing. Lord, Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord, and as Sue has waited on the Lord, she receives her strength now, and all of those that are waiting and looking for that. And we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we want to leave with a power verse, and it's Amen. Psalms 511. This is what it says. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice, and let them sing joyful praise forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. Take that promise with you. Until next time, we love you. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.